Mongolian area uh, in the early 1200s. And he started his dynasty going, and then uh, his descendants, Kublai Khan and others, went into China. They were grandsons of Genghis Khan, and uh, they managed to um, take over large parts of China. And um, what were they called in China as emperors? They were, um, when Marco Polo goes to China, who does he meet? He meets a Mongol emperor of, uh, of um, China. It's in the Marco Polo travel books. Uh, in uh, the armies, the contingents that come into the Middle East are led by another grandson of uh, Genghis Khan, Hulagu. Hulagu. I like that name. Just like you'd expect. And when they come through, it's scorched earth. They don't believe in, they're not interested in subject populations. They're not interested in uh, anything but really plunder, and um, that's it. And everyone is killed, and everything is burned. And that's what happened to the Mongol so called. You've heard of the Mongol horde, maybe? The Mahong, that's a different horde. This wasn't a horde. That came through in the Middle East. Another horde from other descendants of Genghis Khan went through Russia and the steppes of Central Asia and got all the way into Europe, uh, into Hungary, where they were stopped. And the Magyars in Hungary are descendants of the Mongol so called horde uh, that swept through Russia. And there, those were tremendously devastating uh, things that came all the way through the Russian steppes in the Central Russia. A lot of the Russian legends, I don't know, have you ever seen the Russian movie Alexander Nevsky? Anyone seen that movie, a Russian nationalist movie? Music by Prokofiev? In any event, they were made uh, to picture the Russian resistance to the Mongols and also the Russian resistance to the Teutonic Knights, both East and West, who were coming in both sides. So you get a lot of old Russian stories that tell the the story of great Russian heroes who were supposed to be resisting, but really the horde swept over Russia and came into Europe and really was stopped somewhere in Hungary. Well, the Hulagu group took Baghdad and killed everyone, burned everything, and killed all the Caliph's family. I mean, I mean that was it. Exterminated the Caliph. There's no Caliphate after the Mongol, and that was 1257. So that's what happened, and that's the end of the Abbasid Caliphate. So when did it begin? Twelve, uh, 750 about? 740, 748, but by the time it took everything over, 750, 751. And then on into all the way 1257. Now we're going to move to a cultural part of this course momentarily for the rest of the term after I finish the history of things. And one of the reasons that we'll move over to culture talking about the Abbasids is that under the Abbasids, that's when Islamic culture really flourished. So even though there were these uh, political situations going on and other things of that kind, culture was really encouraged in the 800s, particularly the height of the Abbasid Caliphate. And in the 900s, it uh, started to fall off in the 10 hundreds. But the golden age of uh, Islamic culture, or Arabic, uh, uh, really Islamic culture, is in the uh, 800s and 900s on into the early 10 hundreds, and then things begin to fall apart and deteriorate to some extent. But that's the golden age, if you want. And uh, the Abbasids encouraged this, encouraged cultural things. And uh, for instance, at one time in the um, city of Baghdad, uh, the story goes that there were three translation houses working night and day to translate all of Greek literature into Arabic. All Greek philosophical texts, all Greek scientific texts, all Greek medical treatises, everything was translated into Arabic in, uh, in Baghdad. And uh, that influenced a lot of Arabic culture, from mathematics to astronomy. Uh, the Arabs had translated Euclid. They knew all the dialogues of Plato. They knew all of Aristotle. All this was put into Arabic and uh, you know, created an Arab of philosophy philosophers that succeeded Aristotle and these people. We'll talk about them when we talk about the culture that we're going to talk about uh, presently. 
But everything was going, well, it was started really in the 800s in Baghdad in this area of culture. So that's why we'll, and one of the things we're going to start with in the culture are the pre-Islamic Bedouin poets. You say, well, why do we do the pre-Islamic Bedouin poets in the Bedouin period? Ah, because the collections of poetry were done in Baghdad under the Abbasids in the 800s. That's when the collections were done in order to teach people, people, new people coming into Islam and Arab culture, what the classical Arab Bedouin culture was, and to also give them the Arabic of the desert. Because the Arabic of the desert was considered to be the pure, perfect Arabic. But the editors of these collections were mostly Persians. It was mostly Persian intellectuals who had come into Islam who were collecting the Arab poems basically to get control of the Arab language so they could learn it, learn the perfect Arabic. And that's what the, uh, that's what the Abbasid Caliphate was like. The Abbasid Caliphate was a kind of pan-Islamic Caliphate. It was a many people Caliphate. It wasn't a Arab national Caliphate pro, uh, 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 per se. And at one point, the Abbasid Caliphs even tried to assimilate the Shiite line. And um, after the first generation of Abbasid Caliphs, the ones I said were one was called Jafar, the first one, and the other was called Al-Mansur, and that would be the late 700s. Al-Mansur means uh, victorious. And uh, his son was Harun. Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid, you may have heard of him. He's the famous Islamic Arab caliphate in all song and story. The Thousand and One Nights, the Arabian Nights, are written about Harun. Harun is the son of Al-Mansur. And that's where the flowering takes place, around 800. Harun sends representatives to Charlemagne, and Charlemagne sends representatives to Harun. And they're in touch with each other. Harun's capital is Baghdad, and it's fabled in its glory and beauty. And that's all in the famous Thousand and One Nights stories about Harun and the uh, fabled stories of his palaces and all those incredibly, uh, you know, imaginative folk tales. Alibaba and the Forty Thieves and things like that. It's all from the Thousand and One Nights, but it all centers on Harun. You see Disney cartoons about this. That's about probably the level of its penetration in the general society, and you see these cartoons about, you know, the flying carpet, the palaces, the caliph, it's always Harun. Uh, 